Hey everybody, this is a section from uh, John Kelly's The Twilight of World Trotskyism. Uh, I know nothing about this book, but I'm just kind of looking at secondary sources that kind of give me a feel for like um, the overall gestalt, <laughs> the overall uh, uh, bird's eye view of uh, Trotskyism as a movement. Um, I don't know how many chapters of this book I'm going uh, to be reading, uh, but um, I uh, am going to re at least read this section so I can compare and contrast the uh, historiography um, of uh, different folks in on this topic. Okay, I'm going to read the preface and acknowledgments. Actually, I'm going to start way back. Actually, I'm going to read the table of contents. Um, chapter one is titled The Origins and Content of Trotskyism, which is what I'm going to be re re reading today. Uh, the sections are Permanent Revolution, The United Front, Transitional Demands, the Revolutionary Vanguard Party, the Fourth International, Rank and File Organization Against the Trade Union Bureaucracy, Stalinism in the Worker State, Revolution in the Dictatorship of the Proletariat, the Imperialist Epoch, Conclusions. Chapter 2 is titled A Brief Account of the Four Main Centers of World Trotskyism, Argentina, Britain, France, and the USA. <laughs> And the sections here in this chapter are Argentina, Britain, France, USA, Conclusions. The third chapter is titled The Current State of World Trotskyism, Membership and Organization. The sections are Membership and Organization, Trotskyist Fourth Internationals, Trotskyist Political Influence and Support, Other Evidence on Political Influence, Conclusions. Chapter four is titled the Dynamics of World Trotskyism. The sections are titled The Baleful Influence of Stalinism, question mark, Cycles of Protest and Absence of Trotskyist Party Growth and Influence, Trotskyist-led Social Movements, The Bolivian and Sri Lankan Success Stories, question mark, Conclusions. Chapter 5 is titled Explaining the minor Marginality of World Trotskyism. The sections are titled, Reforms are no longer possible. The choice is, quote, socialism or barbarism, end quote. Party and electoral programs. We demand everything. Parliamentary elections decide nothing. Fair to grasp the relationship between class struggle and class consciousness. The conflation of protest, rebellion, and revolution. Quote, if only there had been a mass revolutionary party, dot, 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 end quote. Lamentation replaces analysis. Let's build a new mass anti-capitalist workers' party. The specters of Lenin and Stalin or the unattractiveness of Bolshevism. Orthodox and radical Trotskyism, ideological certitude, electoral delusion, and millenarian fantasy. <laughs> The final chapter is titled The Twilight of World Trotskyism, which is the name of the book. And there's an appendix titled Trotskyist Organizations in Argentina, Britain, France, and the USA, April 2022. Um, what else is in this book? Um, it looks like there's some charts. There's a, a list of figures here. It says number of Trotskyist Fourth Internationals, 1938 to 2022. Trotskyist party vote shares in national elections, 37 countries, 1929 to 2022. Trotskyist vote shares in, in general elections, England and Wales, 1974 to 2019. Trotskyist vote shares in U.S. congressional elections, 1972 to 2020. Trotskyist vote shares in general elections, Argentina, 1973 to 2021. Trotskyist vote shares in presidential elections, France, 1969 to 2022. <laughs>
um, has a list of the tables that are featured in this book. Uh, the core elements of, quote, Trotskyism. Communist and Trotskyist party membership peak figures for countries. Radical left party membership peak levels. The 32 fourth internationals. The highest Trotskyist vote shares. Parliamentary elections in countries with regular Trotskyist electoral participation. Radical left party peak vote shares in parliamentary elections since 1990. <laughs> um, I want to read uh, also through some of these abbreviations that he provides because um, I need to kind of drill these into my skull. Said, okay, so there's the CORQI, Organizing Committee for the Reconstitution of the Fourth International. France. The CRCI, Coordinating Committee for the Refoundation of the Fourth International, Argentina. The CWI, Committee for a Workers International, Britain. FIT, Workers Left Front, Argentina. FT CI, Trotskyist Fraction, Fourth International. IBT, International Bolshevik Tendency, USA. ICFI, International Committee of the Fourth International, USA. ICLFI, International Communist League, Fourth Internationalist, USA. IMT, International Marxist Tendency, Britain. IRI, International Revolutionary Left, Spain. ISA, International Socialist Alternative. Belgium, ISO, International Socialist Organization, USA, IST, International Socialist Tendency, Britain. Those are like the Cliff Socialist Workers' Party people. LCR, Revolutionary Communist League, a forerunner of the NPA, France. LIS, International Socialist League, Argentina. LITCI, International Workers League, Fourth International, Argentina. The LSSP, Lanka Socialist Party, Sri Lanka. MAS, Movement for Socialism, Argentina and Bolivia. MST, Movimiento Socialista de los Trabajadores, Workers Socialist Movement, Argentina. Um, the NPA, uh, New Anti-Capitalist Party, France. PCF, Communist Party of France. PCI, International Communist Party, France. Partito Obrero, Workers' Party, Argentina. I guess I, sorry, I'm, I want you to know that I'm being a very good man right now and uh, saving you from hearing me uh, pronounce these in uh their uh, native language. The POI, Independent Workers' Party, France. POID, Democratic Independent Workers' Party, France. POR, Revolutionary Workers' Party, Argentina and Bolivia. PSOL, Socialism and Freedom Party, Brazil. PST, Socialist Workers' Party, Argentina. PSTU, Unified Socialist Workers' Party, Argentina and Brazil. PSUV, United Socialist Party of Venezuela. PT, Workers' Party, Brazil. PTS, Workers' Socialist Party, Argentina. Revolutionary Communist International Tendency, Vienna. RLP, Radical Left Party. I don't know what, where that's from. SWP, Socialist Workers' Party. Britain, USA, and Australia. Um, those are very different groups. Uh, the uh, Socialist Workers Party of Britain is is has its roots in the uh, International uh, Socialist. Uh, I don't remember the last part. Uh, organization. I don't. I don't know. But uh, around Tony Cliff and the USA and Australia uh, do not. Um, UCI. Internationalist Communist Union, France. 
UITCI, International Workers Unity Fourth International Argentina, USFI, United Secretariat of the Fourth International France, WRP, Workers Revolutionary Party Britain. And there's some prefaces and acknowledgments. Which is uh, like a few pages. The Trotskyist movement has an unparalleled record of political failure. In almost a century of existence, Trotskyists have never led a revolution, won a national election, or built an enduring mass political party, with the possible exception of the Sri Lankan Lanka Sama Samaja Party, LSSP, in the 1950s. In practically every country where it exists, the Trotskyist movement is organizationally minuscule, politically marginal, and deeply fragmented. Why write a book, a second book no less, about a failed movement? The earlier volume focused almost exclusively on Britain, although it did refer to parties and organizations in other countries and contained a chapter on the many Fourth Internationals. The book mapped the rise of British Trotskyist organizations from their formation in the 1930s through the bleak years of the 1950s, when their total membership was counted in the hundreds, to their zenith in the golden years between the mid-1960s and the mid-1980s. That period marked the high water point of Trotskyist membership and influence within the Labour Party and the trade unions. There followed the period of disintegration and decline in which the largest group, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, imploded into a host of tiny fragments, whilst two other large groups, the Socialist League and the Militant Tendency, underwent dramatic splits. The upshot was that by the early 2000s, total membership of British Trotskyist groups had been reduced from its 1985 peak from around 20,000 to less than 7,000. Notwithstanding a small recovery in membership since 2005, the movement failed to rebuild significantly through the economic crash of 2007 to 2008. The ensuing decade of economic austerity and right-wing government and the array of protests over issues such as public spending, climate change, and racism. As a result, in the years following the book's completion, the Trotskyist movement in Britain appears to have entered a new period of crisis. Signaled by the profound split in the Socialist Party and its worldwide organization, the Committee for Work a Workers International, in 2019, and by the expulsion of hundreds of Trotskyists who had flocked into the Labour Party during the tenure of leftist leader Jeremy Corbyn from 2015 to 2000. Many of the weaknesses and failings of the Trotskyist movement are rooted in its powerful attachment to doctrine, a distinctive set of foundational and axiomatic propositions, reflecting the method, structure, and policies of the Russian Bolsheviks, and thought to be essential for the construction of a mass revolutionary party and its victorious revolution. Occasionally, however, British Trotskyist groups have set aside some of these failed revolutionary precepts and focused on building broad-based single-issue movements with wide appeal, such as the Anti-Nazi League in the 1970s and the Anti-Poll Tax Federation in the late 1980s. Where these movements have succeeded, it has been despite, not because of their Trotskyist provenance. British Trotskyism is worthy of study because it is one of the leading centers of the world movement with six of the world's fourth internationals headquarters head in the UK. But three other countries are also home to multiple internationals and possess relatively large Trotskyist organizations, namely Argentina, France, and the United States. The question that we should then ask is whether the travails and weaknesses of British Trotskyism are also replicated in those countries or in the, is the British case an outlier and distinct from its foreign counterparts? Certainly in recent years, those three Trotskyist movements have also experienced significant problems. In the USA, the largest Trotskyist group, the International Socialist Organization, dissolved itself in 2019. The Spartacist League ceased to function in 2021 and is now more bound, and the Socialist Workers Party of the USA continues to decline. In France, the Parti Ouvrière Indépendant, POI, suffered a major split in 2015, whilst the 2021 split in the Nouveau Parti Anticapitaliste, NPA, cut its membership to around 1,500, down from almost 10,000 at its 2009 launch. Likewise, in Argentina, where one of the country's largest groups, the Partido Obrero, PO, experienced a major split in 2019. 
Some of these original, <coughs> some of these national splits have subsequently reverberated across other countries, creating another raft of new, quote, fourth internationals, end quote. The second reason for a new text relates to political context. The 21st century has been marked by multiple waves of revolts and protests unprecedented in their geographical scale, size, and duration. Varied in their demands, methods, and constituencies, these protests have arguably created significant opportunities for leftist resurgence and political realignments involving new parties as well as new electoral coalitions. Ideally, these forces would begin making inroads into wealth, income, and social inequalities, improving health and social services, and tackling environmental degradation. Even in the face of concerted political opposition, programs of radical reforms can transform the life chances of working people, as shown, for example, by the Brazilian Partido dos Trabalhadores, Workers' Party, during its period of rule in the early 2000s. Yet Trotskyist organizations everywhere consistently disparage and dismiss programs of radical reform as having little or no intrinsic value and comprising a distraction from the real business of politics, the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism. They seek to mobilize and energize their small, often young and vocal membership with an apocalyptic vision in which their tiny organizations are rapidly transformed into mass revolutionary parties leading a global wave of successful anti-capitalist insurgencies. In this view, the treacherous parties of social democracy, radical leftism, Stalinism, and environmentalism will be swept aside as the Trotskyists ultimately fulfill their historic destiny. In reality, the Trotskyist movement has entered a new period of decline and fragmentation which continued, with continued membership losses and major splits and crises in the largest parties and internationals around the world. The Trotskyist-led revolutionary scenario, never enacted anywhere despite almost a century of effort, amounts to a tragic and wasteful misdirection of political energy and resources away from serious radical politics. How much more could be achieved by young radicals and militants concerned about injustice, inequality, oppression, and exploitation, and climate change if their enthusiasm and energy were focused elsewhere instead of on wasted forlorn attempts at building, quote, the revolutionary party, end quote. Um, just a, the note on the D there, uh, that's the, uh, classic, um, the classic, uh, anarchist, uh, like, pithy comment on, uh, Leninist parties is that they all want to, they all want to be Lenin. That means they all want to be the one, they all want to be the revolutionary party. Um, it's very interesting when you talk to these people about this and, uh, like they're into like vanguardist uh, Leninist parties, um, that there not is not one vanguardist Leninist party or attempted vanguardist or wannabe vanarchist uh, Leninist party in any uh, particular uh, location. Um, what do you do about uh, those people? Um, are those pe like what is the role of those people in like the uh, 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 revolutionary uh, government that you seek to? Uh, enact, uh, the one-party state government that you seek to enact. Um, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a question that, I mean, I haven't asked anyone this to their face, but like, I imagine it's a very difficult question to answer, but that's just a thought to myself. Um, the primary aim of this book is to analyze the reasons behind the historic failure of the Trotskyist movement around the world. Chapter 1, therefore, begins the assessment by briefly recapitulating the origins of Trotskyism as a political current within the communist movement and elaborating its major elements. Chapter 2 describes the historical development of Trotskyism in the four countries where it has sunk the deepest roots and which house the clear majority of the world's fourth internationals, Argentina, Britain, France, and the USA. Chapter 3 then proceeds to map the current state of global Trotskyist the global Trotskyist movement. Whatever their current size and status, Trotskyist organizations aspire to become mass political parties and lead revolutionary seizures of power. It is therefore appropriate to examine them through the metric applied to mainstream parties, namely organization, membership, and political influence. Chapter 4 looks at the dynamics of the Trotskyist movement, focusing in particular on the supposedly harmful effects of the communist movement. 
It then examines the role of Trotskyist organizations, the various, quote, cycles of protest, end quote, that have occurred in the latter half of the 20th century and the early years of the 21st century, as well as their role in a variety of social movements. The final section of the chapter examines the two successive stories frequently cited in Trotskyist literature, excuse me, the two success stories, excuse me, the final section of the chapter examines the two success stories frequently cited in Trotsky's literature, namely the cases of Bolivia and Sri Lanka. Chapter 5 sets out and examines a wide variety of explanations for the chronic and sustained weakness of the Trotskyist movement, including their flawed appraisals of contemporary politics and economics, their ultra-radical programs and policies, their failures to understand in understanding the dynamics of protest and the baleful legacy of Soviet communism. It is argued that these weaknesses are rooted in Trotskyist doctrine and are therefore integral, not peripheral, features of world Trotskyism. Chapter 6 concludes. I have discussed the Trotskyist movement with many people over the years, with particular thanks to Gregor Gall for kindly reading and commenting on an earlier version of the manuscript and for providing me with a regular stream of information and updates on the Trotskyist movement. Thanks for all... Thanks are also due to four anonymous referees for their many helpful and constructive comments. Uh, I'm looking at the thing for Gregor Gall. It says, uh, the introduction says, Gregor Gall, born 1967, is a British academic and writer and has taught at several British universities. Um, looks like he's written a book on George Strummer, which is uh, badass. Um, I wanted to... Uh, It looks like he's some kind of like Scottish independence guy. And it says, um, in terms, there's a section that says political views, so I'll read that. Uh, originally uh, a member of Labour Students and the Labour Party from 1985, Gregor Gall ended his membership of these in 1888 over the issue of the poll tax, then joining the Socialist Workers' Party, Trotskyist Party, in 1990. He joined the Scottish Socialist Party in advance of the Socialist Workers' Party joining in mass, leaving the Socialist Workers' Party in 2004 after many years of growing disagreements. He was a member of the editorial board of the Scottish Left Review from 2003, was editor of its book on the Scottish Left Review Press, and has been the editor of the journal of the Scottish Labour History Society called Scottish Labour History since 2008. Since 2015, as, ed as edit joint editor of the Excuse me, as joint editor with Jim Phillips of the University of Glasgow. Following the resignation of Robin McAlpine as director of the Jimmy Reed Foundation and editor of the Scottish Left Review to concentrate on the common wheel, Gall stepped in as director and editor. Gall was a member of the board of management of the Jimmy Reed Foundation since its inception. Gall resigned as director and editor in December 2022. He's written lengthy and detailed biography of Tommy Sheridan. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, now we can start, uh, the chapter. Um, probably could have made my own video of the preface, but, you know. Uh, yeah. I probably will forget, but it would be nice if I put a thing that said, like, actual introduction when the chapter starts. But no one's, uh, no one listens to shit, so I just do my own thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, uh, it looks like this is a end notes. No, wait. This looks like an end notes, not a footnotes kind of thing, so, uh, you'll be spared. Um, at least partially. 
some of the uh, uh, interruptions, but I probably will end up looking things up on the internet uh, while I'm reading. And hopefully that'll be helpful to anyone uh, who's listening to this and not just be an irritant. Anyway, the origins of and content of Trotskyism. The cumulative record of Trotsky's political failure does not reflect any lack of effort or commitment. Following Trotsky's defeat by Stalin in the factional conflict of the 1920s and Trotsky's subsequent expulsion from the party in the Soviet Union, Trotsky began to build a rival communist movement with its own parties and international organization. The Fourth International was launched in 1938 with Trotskyist organizations in 31 countries. See Alexander, 1991. Today, 2022, such organizations can be found in 69 countries on every continent, and some can trace their lineage as far back as the early 1930s. The reasons for their extremely limited size and influence across so many places and time periods must therefore be located in features that are intrinsic to the Trotskyist movement and which transcends spatial and temporal specificities. All Trotskyist organizations either label themselves as political parties or aspire to become parties once they have outgrown their current status as a, quote, league, quote, group, quote, tendency, or, quote, organization. Mainstream political parties are conventionally understood as having three core goals. The maximization of votes, participation in governmental office, and implementation of policy. See Strom and Mueller, 1999. Parties are then typical, typically classified into families based on origins, international links, and policies. Themselves linked to values and obvious examples include conservatives, liberals, and greens. See Gallagher et al., 19, I mean, 2011. Trotskyist groups, however, can be distinguished from most other parties because of a fourth attribute, their attachment to doctrine a body of propositions conventionally derived inter alia from the works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, the resolutions of the first four congresses of the Third International, those attended by Lenin and Trotsky, and the program adopted by the opening congress of the Fourth International in 1938. Trotskyist groups and their leaders are keen to stress that, quote, Trotskyism, end quote, should be regarded as the contemporary form of Leninism or Bolshevism and sharply differentiated from, quote, official, end quote, or Stalinist communism. Isolating the main elements of Trotsky's thought is difficult, however, not least because Trotsky shifted his views on several major, issue, major issues over his lifetime. For example, Trotsky was critical for many years of Lenin's insistence on the vital role of de a democratic centralist vanguard party, but came round to this position in 1917. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, um, Trotsky produced a pretty sophisticated, uh, rich, um, uh, critique of substitutionism in, uh, his days before becoming a Bolshevik in, uh, 1917. <sighs> Everywhere, Trotsky's views remain seemingly unchanged. As with the theory of permanent revolution... Their lack of precision rendered them amenable to different interpretations and evaluations. See Radisson, Dunn, 2006. Um, I don't know if it's Hugo Radis, but I know Hugo Radis is uh, favorably mentioned by, or I believe he's favorably mentioned, it might even be a friend of Werner Bonefeld. Um, yeah, Radisson, Dunn, 2006. It is also true that Trotsky's political thought and writings are so wide-ranging, spanning history, contemporary politics, literature, culture, and morality, it is difficult to offer a concise, comprehensive, and uncontentious summary. See Trotsky, 1923, 1929, 1931-33, 1939-A, and something well, published after his death in 1970. Nevertheless, by drawing on a variety of sources, it is possible to set out the core elements of what we can call, quote, Trotskyist doctrine, end quote. A set of propositions that structure the perspectives, programs, and policies of Trotskyist organizations around the world. See Alexander, 1991. Ben Said, 2009. Deutscher, 1954, 1959, 1963. Hallis, 1979. Kanai Paz, 1978, which I've been kind of reading on and off about now. Uh, see Mandel, 1979, 1995. It will be argued that, quote, Trotskyism, end quote, 
embraces nine core elements. It goes without saying that not all groups and individuals will endorse all of the propositions below, and there is ample scope for disagreement about the meaning and applicability of key terms. Nor is there any presumption that all of the nine elements are equally important. It is also true that some of what now passes for, quote, Trotskyism, end quote, consists of propositions shared by many Marxists, e.g. that capitalism is an exploitative economic system and that the working class is the only social force that can destroy it. Um, there's a uh, table here of the core elements of Trotskyism. Uh, theory of permanent revolution, uh, element one. Theory of permanent revolution versus stages theory and, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. Two, united front tactic versus popular front. Three, Transitional demands versus minimum and maximum demands. Four, democratic centralist revolutionary vanguard. Five, a new revolutionary leadership, the fourth international versus communist, social, democratic, and reformist labor movement leaders. Six, building a rank and file movement against the trade union bureaucracy. Seven, critical analysis of the Stalinist states versus USSR as socialist. Eight, Revolution is seizure of power and the creation of proletarian dictatorship versus parliamentarism and reformism. 9. Imperialist epoch is one of wars and revolutions versus capitalist stability. I want to reread that list again. Um, 1. Theory of permanent revolution versus stages theory and, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. 2. United Front Tactic versus Popular Front. Three, Transitional Demands versus Minimum and Maximum Demands. Four, Democratic Centralist Revolutionary Vanguard. Five, A New Revolutionary Leadership, the Fourth International versus Communist, Social Democratic, and Reformist Labor Movement Leaders. Six, Building a Rank and File Movement Against the Trade Union Bureaucracy. Seven, Critical Analysis of the Stalinist States versus USSR as Socialist. Eight, Revolution is seizure of power and the creation of proletarian dictatorship versus parliamentarism and reformism. 9. Imperialist epoch is one of wars and revolutions versus capitalist stability. Okay. I'm done reading the table. Back to the text. Moreover, some propositions adhered to by Trotskyist organizations originated with Lenin or emerged from the Bolshevik Party and the Communist International e.g. the necessity for a democratic centralist vanguard party, which is why Trotsky and his supporters initially described themselves as Bolshevik-Leninists. Quote, Trotskyism, therefore represents just one of the ideological currents that crystallized after the Russian Revolution and others include official or Stalinist communism and Maoism. See Alexander 2001. I believe that's a history of, uh, it's his, you know, uh, Robert J. Alexander wrote like a global history of uh, Trotskyism. It's kind of like encyclopedic in how it's written. Just kind of like a uh, very useful resource for um, looking up um, um, Trotskyist uh, political parties and uh, political figures and uh, debates and whatnot. Uh, I think his goes up to, uh, I think the book was published in 1991 and goes up to like 85. I think the Alexander 2001 book is a history of uh, international uh, Maoism. I don't know if he wrote a two books, one about um, uh, Maoism in the underdeveloped world and Maoism in the developed world, but he definitely wrote one at that period uh, about Maoism in the developed world. Um, so I believe that's, I, I'm i going to guess that that's what the book on Mao, that, that reference to Alexander uh, alludes to. Um. Some readers may judge this exercise in summation so fraught with problems as to be worthless, but what would that would be a mistake. Debates about doctrine, revisionism, and orthodoxy have dogged the Trotskyist movement from its inception. Without some attempt to specify the key elements of Trotskyist doctrine, however difficult and problematic, it is impossible to make any sense of these disputes. Adherence to the core elements of Trotskyist doctrine is believed by most Trotskyist groups to constitute an essential precondition for the achievement of their overarching goal, the overthrow of capitalism and the creation of a socialist society. 
Both party policies and analyses of current and historical events are therefore defended by demonstrating their compliance with doctrine. Conversely, the policies of rival organizations are often attacked because of their deviation from one or other elements of doctrine. Never mind. Sorry, I lost my spot. The importance of doctrine perhaps emerges most clearly in the splits that have bedeviled the Trotskyist movement from its inception and in the consequent sectarian hostility to those groups with a different understanding of whatever issue happens to have triggered the latest dispute. That said, it is important to note that several propositions have proved to be contentious even amongst Trotskyists. The insistence on, quote, transitional demands, end quote, claims that will attract popular support but whose achievement will begin to undermine the capitalist economy is highly variable. For example, some Latin American internationals are strongly attached to them, e.g. Fraction Trotskista, Cuarta Internacional, Trotskyist Fraction Fourth International, FTCI, and Liga Internacional de los Trabajadores, Cuarta Internacional, International Workers League, 4th International, LITCI, but others are not, e.g. Liga Internacional Socialista, International Socialist League, LIS, and Unidad Internacional de Trabajadoras y Trabajadores, Cuarta Internacional, International Workers' Unity, 4th International, UITCI. The idea of the revolutionary vanguard party is supported by almost all Trotskyist groups and internationals, but the Paris-based mainstream international, sometimes known as the Mandalay International, or the United Secretariat of the Fourth International, um, if you're interested, uh, I, have a, uh, I have the chapter from Robert J. Alexander's book on the United Secretariat of the Fourth International, which reunified out of the separate... Um, uh, International Secretariat and the uh, International Committee uh, that uh, partially uh, reunified in 1963. Um, anyway, the USFI has for over 25 years promoted the idea of, quote, broad left parties, end quote. Organizations that will embrace a wide range of left-wing viewpoints and work towards socialism through increasingly radical structural reforms. Widely cited examples include Die Linke in Germany, Podemos, is that Spain, right? And Syriza, Greece, whose actions in government, whether national or local, have provoked widespread criticism from many other sections of the Trotskyist movement. Permanent revolution. The theory of, quote, permanent revolution, end quote, is one of the most distinctive leitmotifs of Trotsky's doctrine and originated in the early years of the 20th century. Conventional wisdom among Russian social democrats in the early 20th century was that increased political freedoms coupled with land reform and economic growth would eventually create an advanced capitalist economy and liberal democracy, but only then would socialist revolution become a possibility. In Results and Prospects, written in, 2000, excuse me, in 1906, written shortly after the 1905 revolution, and again in The Permanent Revolution in, of 1929, published in 1929, Trotsky advanced a radically different prognosis, the theory of permanent revolution, in essence, Trotsky argued that within the globalized world economy, individual countries comprise both backward sectors such as subsistence farming and highly advanced sectors, such as large manufacturing plants employing modern technology and often owned by foreign capital. This process of what he called, quote, combined and uneven development, end quote, gave rise in Russia to a local bourgeoisie with limited economic power because, of the small size of and foreign ownership of the industrial sector and little political power because of the czarist autocracy. Um, 
I'm going to read the Wikipedia real quick for uneven and combined development. Uh, uneven and combined development, unequal and combined development, or uneven development is an is a concept in Marxian political economy intended to describe the dynamics of human history involving the interaction of capitalist laws of motion and starting world market conditions whose national units are highly heterogeneous. The concept is used by Marxist scholars and concerned with so me, Marxist scholars concerned with economic development. David Harvey is an advocate of the usefulness of the theory to reconstruct historical materialism on modern terms is an accepted key concept in economic in academic economic geography. The idea was applied systematically by Leon Trotsky around the turn of the 20th century to the case of Russia when he was analyzing the developmental possibilities for industrialization in the Russian Empire and the likely future of the Tsarist regime in Russia. The notion was then generalized and became the basis of Trotsky's politics of permanent revolution, which implied a rejection of the Stalinist idea that a human society inevitably developed through a unilinear sequence of necessary, quote, stages. Before Trotsky, Nikolai Chernyshevsky and Vasily Vorontsov and others proposed similar ideas. Back to the text. <laughs> Consequently, said Trotsky, it would be unable to lead a democratic revolution. The bourgeoisie would be unable to lead a democratic revolution and that task would fall to the working class. However, the power and radical demands of the working class would push it in the direction of socialism so that the bourgeois revolution would thus flow inexorably and uninterruptedly into the socialist revolution in a process of, quote, permanent revolution, end quote. A socialist revolution in one country would likely trigger similar events elsewhere given the interconnected global capitalist economy. Indeed, in a backward country like Russia, socialist revolution could only survive and flourish if there were revolutions elsewhere. Stalin's, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, was an illusion. The theory has been repeatedly used to argue that revolutionaries in less developed countries should not rest content with, quote, democratic revolutions, end quote, as in the Arab world 2010 to 2011, but should seek the, to push the developments in the direction of socialist revolution. It is important to note that the debate between Stalin's, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, and Trotsky's, quote, permanent revolution, end quote, was needlessly polarized by both sides. See Johnstone, 1968, and Crasso, 1967. At critical junctures such as early 1918 and again in 1921 with the stabilization of world capitalism, Lenin argued that the defense and consolidation of Soviet power was the most effective method of strengthening the forces of international revolution, whilst Trotsky was instrumental in normalizing relations with Germany through the Treaty of Rapallo. See Deutscher 1960, so I mean, Deutscher 1959, and Harding 1983. Uh, Deutscher being the biographer of Trotsky, and um, I believe that Harding being the author of a book, uh, something to the effect of uh, the political and social thought of Lenin, or the political thought of Lenin. Um, um, Real quick on, quick on the Treaty of Rapallo. The Treaty of Rapallo was an agreement signed on the 16th of April 1922 between the German Republic and Soviet Russia, under which both renounced all territory on financial claims against each other and opened friendly diplomatic relations. The Treaty of Rapallo was negotiated by Foreign Minister Georgi Chicherin and Ger German Foreign Minister Walter R R Rathenau. Or Rathenau. Walter Rathenau is probably actually what I said. It was a major victory for Russia, especially and also Germany, and a major disappointment to France and the United Kingdom. The term, quote, spirit of Rapallo, end quote, was used for an improvement in friendly relations between Germany and Russia. The Treaty of Rapallo was signed in Rapallo, which is in Italy. Uh, ratifications were exchanged in Berlin on the 31st of January 1923 and registered in League of Nations. 
treaty series on the 19th of September 1923. The treaty did not include any military provisions, but secret military cooperation was already scheduled between Germany and Russia, which was a violation of the tre Treaty of Versailles. A supplementary agreement signed in Berlin on the 5th of November extended the treaty to cover Germany's relations with the other Soviet republics of Ukraine, Belarus, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. Ratifications were exchanged in Berlin on the 26th of October 1923, and the supplementary protocol was registered in League of Nations Treaty Series on the 18th of July 1924. The agreement was reaffirmed by the Treaty of Berlin 1926. Back to the text. Moreover, the debates did not turn simply on matters of doctrine or theory, but also involved differing estimates of the, the policies required to ameliorate the demoralization caused by revolutionary defeats in other countries and in the ensuing isolation of the Soviet Union. It is also important to note that since Trotsky's lifetime, there have been numerous exceptions to the schema of permanent revolution, all of which have posed challenges for those anxious to preserve ideological orthodoxy the independent struggle in India, the communist and peasant-led revolution in China, the revolutions in Algeria, Bolivia, Ethiopia, and Vietnam, and the Cuban revolution led by armed sections of the intelligentsia. See Anderson, 1984, and Howard and King, 1989. New section, the United Front. As the post-1917 revolutionary wave abated from 1920 to 1921, the newly formed communist parties often found themselves leading a minority of workers in opposition to the majority social democrats and were forced to reappraise their strategy and tactics. Trotsky and other common turn leaders therefore developed the idea of the quote united front end quote, an agreement between communists and social democrats, democrats to engage in joint struggle around specific immediate issues. By promoting unity in action whilst maintaining the freedom to criticize social democracy, communists sought to win recruits and gain influence. See Trotsky, 1922. After, the 19, after 1928, the common turn abandoned the policy, declaring that social democrats were now the main enemy of the revolutionary movement, but in Germany, this disastrous policy split the labor movement, facilitating the Nazi rise to power. Two years later, the Comintern executed a radical volte face, calling for an anti-fascist popular front. I'm going to read the Wikipedia for a popular front. A popular front is, quote, any coalition of working class and middle class parties, end quote, including liberal and social democratic ones, quote, united for the defense of democratic forms, end quote, against a, quote, presumed fascist assault, end quote. More commonly, it is, quote, a coalition, especially of leftist political parties against a common opponent, end quote. The term was first used in the mid-1930s in Europe by communists concerned over the ascent of fascism in Italy and Germany, which they sought to combat by coalescing with non-communist party groupings they had previously attacked as enemies. Temporarily successful popular front governments were formed in France, Spain, and Chile in 1936. Not all political organizations who use the term, quote, popular front, end quote, are leftist or coalition forms to defend democratic norms, for example, Popular Front of India. And not all leftist or anti-fascist coalitions use the term, quote, popular front, end quote, in their name. Uh, two years later, the common turn, back to the text, two years later, the common turn executed a radical volta face calling for an anti-fascist, quote, popular front, end quote, of all progressive forces, including bourgeois political parties. For Trotsky, the popular front signified the abandonment of revolutionary socialism in the interest of defending liberal democracy against fascism. During the Spanish Civil War of 1936-39, to 39, for example, the common turn argued for a popular front to defeat the fascist forces led by Franco, whilst Trotsky called for a united front and permanent revolution. Since 
C. Morrow, 1976. I'm guessing that's probably Felix Morrow. Trotsky's antagonism to popular fronts rests on three foundation stones. The idea of the contemporary period as an epoch of wars and revolutions, see below. The theory of permanent revolutions, see above. And the class character of parliamentary democracy. Trotsky's view of parliamentary systems, at least until the early 1930s, does not appear to have differed in any way from Lenin's claim that parliamentary elections merely represented a contest between different bourgeois parties. As a new world was a per war approach, Trotsky was equally scathing about the idea of taking sides in a, quote, struggle against fascism, end quote, a proposal he dismissed as no more than, quote, lame phraseology, end quote. New section, Transitional Demands. Um, according to Wikipedia, a tran in Marxist theory, a tradi transitional demand either is a partial realization of a maximum demand after revolution or an agitational demand made by a socialist organization with the aim of linking the current situation to progress towards their goal of a socialist society. In the 1938 program, back to the text, in the 1938 program, the Fourth International Trotsky argued program of the Fourth International, Trotsky argued that class struggles, including United Front campaign, should center around, quote, transitional demands, end quote. Quote, stemming from today's conditions and from today's consciousness of wide layers of the working class and unalterably leading to one final conclusion, the conquest of power by the proletariat, end quote, Trotsky. These were counterposed to, quote, minimum, end quote, demands that were affordable and would not therefore undermine capitalism and, quote, maximum, end quote, or revolutionary demands that could only be realized under socialism. One of the most popular examples of a transitional demand is the, quote, sliding scale of wages, end quote, designed simultaneously to protect workers against rising inflation and falling prices, excuse me, falling profits, and to question the logic of capitalist profit making. Um, according to Wikipedia, the sliding wage scale consists in increasing the wages as the prices rise in order to maintain the purchasing powers of workers, even if there is inflation. Back to the text. In the course of struggling for such demands and under the leadership of a revolutionary party, Trotsky believed that workers', workers class consciousness would be significantly enhanced. If Trotsky's inadequate grasp of parliamentary democracy was one problem in his strategic political thought, the contradiction and limitations of working class consciousness were to provide another. In its declaration that the chief problem facing contemporary revolutionaries was a, quote, crisis of leadership, end quote, see below, the transitional program clearly implied that a lack of class consciousness and the grip of reformist ideas were less serious problems. Um, I have, I think I have the transitional program on here, but I might not. Yeah, the death agony of capitalism in the Fourth International. Uh, the transitional program, this is according to Wikipedia, the transitional program originally entitled The Death Agony of Capitalism and the Tasks of the Fourth International and later reprinted under the title The Transitional Program and the Struggle for Socialism is a political platform adopted by the 1938 founding Congress of the Fourth International, the international Leninist organization founded by Leon Trotsky. It is an example of a transitional program. Back to the text. According to Trotsky... The, quote, objective conditions, end quote, for revolution already exist because of the stagnation of the productive forces, the consequent impossibility of, quote, systematic social reforms, end quote, and the willingness of the, quote, masses, end quote, to fight. It is therefore the, quote, subjective factor, end quote, the party and its program of traditional demands that becomes decisive, that become decisive, end quote. Not end quote, there's no quote there. There's a citation. The citation says, uh, Bailhart's 1987, see pages 75 to 76. Uh, 
I am currently reading excerpts from Dale Hartz's book on Trotskyism. Um, so, uh, yeah. I was just going to say that you should uh, check those out if you're interested. <laughs> I'm reading that like I'm reading this. I'm just going to read like chapters and hope maybe eventually all the chapters will become read. Okay, so the Revolutionary Vanguard Party, new section. The case for a revolutionary party was clearly argued in the transitional program, but it was a view Trotsky had held for from as early as 1906. See Knaipaz, 1978, pages 142, 316. By 1914, Trotsky had come to believe that revolutionary leadership should be embodied in a militant Bolshevik-type party that comprised the most advanced class-conscious workers organized on the principle of democratic centralism. Stated in its simplest terms, the principle entails free discussion and a free vote on party policy, but unity and action under the direction of the party central committee once policy has been decided. Prior to 1917, he has taken a rather different view. So he had, prior to 1917, Trotsky had taken a rather different view, and during the 1903 dispute among Russian Social Democrats, had expressed strong criticism of Lenin's call for a centralized, disciplined party, whose members worked under the direction of its leading committees. Quote, Lenin's iron hand, end quote, Trotsky claimed, in an ominous and prescient statement would lead, quote, to the party organization substituting itself for the party, the central committee substituting itself for the party organization, and finally the dictator substituting himself for the central committee, end quote. Trotsky, that's the uh, early substitution, critique of substitutionism that I'm talking about, or, or I was talking about earlier. By the early mid 1920s, Trotsky had also come to accept the Bolshevik monopoly of power and was consequently hostile to the idea of rival parties. At the 13th Communist Party Congress in May 1924, he boldly affirmed that, quote, None of us wishes to or can be right against the party. In the last instance, the party is always right because the party is the only historic instrument which the working class possesses for the solution of its fundamental tasks, end quote, Trotsky. I'm uh, reading uh, right now uh, the introduction to the fate of the Russian Revolution, which is an edited volume of uh, uh, texts of critical uh, dissident or, or critical Trotskyism. I think it's the book's title, like a, uh, like a critical Trotskyism in, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't remember if it actually has a date on it, but it's all from like the uh, 30s, 40s, and I think it might go up to the 50s. Anyway, the introduction to it is like a long piece by Sean Matt Gamna, and he attempts to give the impression that the Bolshevik party from its inception in, uh, and from its uh, inception uh, was uh, committed to creating multi-party uh, democracy which I think uh, this quote by Trotsky, which views that the only, uh, uh, this kind of uh, extreme party chauvinism right here, uh, demonstrates that this is uh, not the case. And, you know, if they're going to limit facts, not only limit uh, parties, but limit factions within your own party, um, that uh, kind of demonstrates to me, I think, and convincingly, uh, that um, the uh, Bolshevik uh, party was not committed to multi-party democracy. How can you have democratic centralism? Like a democratic centralism seems to be like a thing for the uh, communist party. Um, I don't know, that's actually not relevant. I was thinking about, you know, where does democratic central how is does how is democratic centralism understood it could could it be understood in relation to, to other parties i guess that's a question uh, i just want to read the wikipedia for the 13th congress of the russian communist party uh the 13th congress of the russian communist party bolsheviks was held during the 23rd to 31st of may 1924 in moscow of the delegates meeting 748 had voting rights and 416 had consultative rights. 
the Congress elected the 13th Central Committee. The 13th Congress of the Russian Communist Party was the Russian Communist Party Bolsheviks first to take place after the death of Vladimir Lenin and represents a transition between the Lenin and Joseph Stalin regimes. The 13th Congress of the Russian Communist Party was also the first confrontation between the left opposition led by Trotsky and the Troika led by Stalin, Grigory Zinoviev, and Lev Kamenev. Um, back to the text. By the time of the transitional program, Trotsky's position had shifted somewhat because that document mentioned, quote, the legalization of Soviet parties, end quote, though subject to the approval of, quote, workers and peasants, end quote, a caveat that would certainly permit an autocratic, quote, workers and peasants movement to outlaw all non-ruling and non-communist parties. I guess that the quote was on a quote workers and peasants end quote movement to outlaw all non-ruling and non-communist parties. Trotsky's attitude to inner party factions was complex. On the one hand, he supported the ban on factions moved by Lenin at the 1921 Bolshevik Party Congress, and as late as 1928 refused to support the latest opposition grouping, the Democratic Centralist Faction, or the wave of strikes called to protest at wage reductions and work intensification. See Merit, 2006. I need to reread that. Um, at the same time, Trotsky had also come to approve the new method of national leadership election known as the, quote, recommended list. End quote. Instead of growing, instead of Congress delegates freely nominating anyone they liked, the new system presented them with a list of candidates drawn up by the outgoing national leadership, which they were invited to approve in its entirety. Diffused throughout the world's communist parties in the 1920s, it has also been adopted by much of the Trotskyist movement, and unsurprisingly, it reproduces an oligarchy that rules for long periods, often decades. See Thompson, 1992, page 45. On the other hand, Trotsky argued quite rightly that if the ban on factions was taken to prohibit any group of party members sharing a view on a contentious issue, then inter-party debate would be extinguished. Meaningful debate implies differences of opinion which in turn can lead to factions. In the book, The New Course, Trotsky struggled with this conundrum but was unable to resolve it. Elsewhere in the same book, Trotsky repeatedly warned of the danger of, quote, bureaucratism, end quote, clearly implying that a section of the party leadership was acting as a faction. A less charitable interpretation is that Trotsky believed in loyalty only to a truly Bolshevik party led by revolutionary Marxists such as himself. Once Trotsky had convinced himself the Russian Communist Party leaders no longer satisfied this criterion, then the normal Bolshevik obligation of party loyalty was rendered nugatory. One objection to factions is that they create a danger of party splits, but Trotsky became increasingly sanguine about this prospect, and by the 1930s had come to see benefits in party schisms. For example, in his 1933 letter to the factionalized Communist League in France, one of the most important centers of left oppositional activity, Trotsky declared that, quote, the League is passing through a first crisis under the banner of great and clear revolutionary criteria. Under these conditions, a splitting off of a part of the League will be a great step forward. It will reject all that is unhealthy, crippled, and incapacitated. It will give a lesson to the vacillating and irresolute elements. It will harden the better sections of the youth. It will improve the inner atmosphere. It will open up before the League new great possibilities. What will be lost partly only temporarily will be regained a hundredfold already at the next stage. End quote. Trotsky, 1933. 
It will be difficult to find a more wholehearted endorsement of the enormous gains and the minimal losses that arise from organizational splits. The Fourth International Trotsky was one of the founders and leaders of the Third International, later known as the... Sorry, I feel like I said something wrong. I don't know if I did. The Fourth International Trotsky is one of the founders and leaders of the Third International, later known as the Common Turn. Founded in 1919 by the Russian Bolsheviks and their allies after the major parties of the Second International had agreed to support their respective national governments in the 1914-18 war. For Lenin, this nationalist trend spelled the effective end of the old international and necessitated the formation of a successor. During the inter-party struggles of the 1920s, Trotsky and his supporters regarded themselves as a faction within the common turn, but after the formation of the Nazi government in 1933, Trotsky came round to the view that the common turn had ceased to be a revolutionary organization. Consequently, Trotsky began to argue that his small national groups needed to be organized into a new international body, a fourth international, capable of challenging and eventually defeating the common turn. In his 1935 diary in exile, Trotsky wrote that the building of the Fourth International, quote, despite its extremely insufficient and fragmentary nature, is the most important work of my life, more important than 1917, more important than the Civil War, end quote. Trotsky, cited in Brotherstone, 1992. At first glance, it is tempting to discount this claim as self-evident hyperbole, but it is worth recalling that Trotsky was a late convert to Bolshevism, and his party loyalty was often questioned by some of his critics, not least by Stalin himself. See Service 2010, two, page 213 to 214. Trotsky's insistence on the salience of the Fourth International may have reflected both tactical and strategic considerations, as well as an awareness of his own fraught relations with the Bolshevik party in pre-revolutionary years. Trotskyist forces in the early 1930s were hardly numerous. The first Trotskyist in Britain, the Balham Group, which was like Harry Wicks and Reg Groves, I think were the original people. Um... I just want to look at this thing from the uh, Wikipedia by the Communist League, UK, 1932. It says that the Communist League was one of the first Trotskyist groups in Britain formed in 1932 by members of the Communist Party of Great Britain in South London, including Harry Wicks, who had been expelled after forming a loose group inside the Communist Party of Great Britain known as the Balham Group. This became the British section of the international left opposition and adopted the name Communist League in June 1933. They published a monthly paper, Red Flag, and quarterly journal, The Communists. Back to the text. Uh, Trotskyist forces in the early 1930s were hardly numerous. The first Trotskyist in Britain, the Balham Group, numbered just 13 people, and throughout the 1930s, Trotsky had to consider the most appropriate tactics for his small groups of followers. See Groves, 1974, page 94. Uh, Reg Groves uh, was one of the uh, members of the Balham uh, Group.
The emergence of leftist part back to the text. The le emergence of leftist parties such as the Independent Labour Party in the UK or the left moving Socialist Party in France led to the creation of the entry tactic or quote entrism. As original formula originally formulated in the so called French term, small groups of Trotskyists would enter a left moving party disseminate their own propaganda, criticize the policies of the party host, and aim to recruit people to their group. The tactic was a short-term measure because sooner rather than later, either the Trotskyists would be expelled or they would resign en masse, having exhausted the recruitment opportunities in the larger organization. The Fourth International was duly founded in 1938, and its program began with a bold and uncompromising declaration, quote, the world historical po the world political situation as a whole is chiefly characterized by a historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat. End quote. Trotsky. The statement followed from Trotsky's view that the quote objective prerequisites end quote for socialist revolution had already matured as the capitalist mode of production had exhausted its economic potential. Yet Trotsky's understanding of quote leadership end quote was never developed theoretically, and not surprisingly, Trotsky was unable to transcend the limitations of the conventional wisdom of the interwar years. In this view, leaders were, quote, born, not made, end quote, and the successful leader was a, quote, great man, end quote. Women rarely appeared in these discussions, distinguished from others by their intelligence, self-confidence, and knowledge, and whose vital role was to issue inf instructions to their followers. <laughs> See Bryman, 1992, pages 2 to 3. That Trotsky adhered to this type of thinking is clear from the following extraordinary claim in his 1935 diary in exile, quote, I had not been present in 1917 in Petersburg. The October Revolution would still have taken, excuse me, had I not been present in 1917 in Petersburg, the October Revolution would still have taken place on the condition that Lenin was present and in command, dot, dot, dot. If Lenin had not become, not been in Petersburg, I doubt whether I could have managed to overcome the resistance of the Bolshevik leaders, end quote. Trotsky's own achievements as a leader in party building were modest. His pre-1917 inter-district group reached a membership of around 14, excuse me, 4,000 by July 1917, a paltry figure compared to the hundreds of thousands who then belonged to the Bolsheviks. One second, I want to see if there's anything for this on there. I want to, yeah, it's the Mezrayansi. Mezrayansi. Usually translated as interdistrictites. Were members of a small independent faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which existed between 1913 and 1917. Although the organization's formal name was the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party Internationalists, the names Mez Ryonka for the organization and Mez Ryonsi for its participants were commonly used to indicate the group's inter intermediate ideological position between the rival Menshevik and Bolshevik wings of the divided Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. The Mez Ryansi merged with the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution of 1917. Back to the text. Trotsky's leftist factions inside the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the CPSU, and the Comintern and the independent Trotskyist parties of the 1930s were always small, notwithstanding their presence in over 30 countries by 1938. Moreover, Trotsky's movement was already displaying the Thisiparis. Thisiparis. The hell does that word mean? Thisiparis tendencies for which it would become notorious. Nine countries contained two Trotskyist groups, including Great Britain, whilst three countries had already managed multiple splits and contained three Trotskyist groups, Argentina, Austria, and the USA. See Alexander, 1991. Oh, Fisiparius means inclined to cause or undergo division into separate parts of group or groups. In biology, uh, 
is an organism that reproduces by fission. New section. Rank and file organization against the trade union bureaucracy. Trotsky's analysis of trade union leadership was consistent with the arguments of Lenin and Luxembourg on its class collaborationist role, but he always placed more stress on its negative role, even going so far as to claim that, quote, the bureaucracy of the trade unions is the backbone of British imperialism, end quote. Trotsky, 1929. This theme was set out even more starkly in the transitional program, with the transitional program's pivotal assertion of the, quote, historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat, end quote. His scattered writings on trade unions sketched out several other themes that have underpinned almost all post-Trotskyist analyses of trade unionism, beginning with the need for revolutionaries to work inside trade unions, however right-wing their leaderships. This argument repeats Lenin's formulation that from left-wing communism, published in 1920, but Trotsky was also at pains to stress that revolutionaries have no time for the, quote, fetish of trade union unity, end quote, because trade unions, quote, are not ends in themselves, end quote. Consequently, revolutionaries should not hesitate to split trade unions and form breakaway organizations if existing leadership proved to be an insuperable hindrance to revolutionary struggle or if the unions became subordinated to the state. Trotsky stressed the necessity to challenge union officialdom as a whole, including both right-wing leaders such as Walter Citrine and Jimmy Thomas, as well as, quote, left-wing officials like coal miners' general secretary A.J. Cook. I'm going to look up these people. Walter Citrine. I'm not going to read this whole thing. It was one of the leading British and international trade unionists of the 20th century. He lived from 1887 to 1883. Apart from Citrine's renowned guide to the conduct of meetings, ABC of chairmanship, Citrine has been little spoken of in the history of the labor movement. More recently, labor historians have begun to reassess Citrine's role. By redefining the role of the Trade Union Congress, TUC, whose general secretary Citrine was from 1926 until 1946, Citrine helped create a far more coherent and effective union force. This in turn transformed the Labour Party into a substantial social democratic force for government from 1939. Citrine was also president of, of the then influential International Federation of Trade Unions from 1928 until 1945. He was also Joint Secretary of the key TUC Labour Party National Joint Council from 1931 and a director of the UK Daily Herald newspaper until 1946, which was then a mass circulation labour paper with considerable influence. In these important roles, Citrine was highly influential in the industrial and political wings of the labour movement. Citrine's prominent involvement helped secure its recovery after the deep crisis and crushing defeat which followed the fall of the British Labour government in 1931. In particular, Citrine played a key role in the mid-1930s in reshaping Labour's foreign policy, especially as regards rearmament and through the all-party anti-Nazi council in which he worked with Winston Churchill. Citrine strengthened the TUC's influence over the Labour Party, Citrine opposed plans by the Labour government in 1931 to cut unemployment benefits. After Ramsay MacDonald formed a coalition with the Conservatives to force his policies through, Citrine led the campaign to have Ramsay MacDonald expelled from the party. Citrine later supported the Atlee government's policy of nationalization and served on the National Coal Board and served as chairman of the Central Electricity Board from 1947 to 57. Citrine was granted a peerage in 1947. Citrine authored ABC of Chairmanship, regarded by many in the labor movement as the, quote, Bible, end quote, of committee chairmanship. His autobiography, Men and Work, was published in 1964 in the second volume, Two Careers, in 1967. Citrine's personal papers are held at the London School of Economics. Here it's Walter Citrine. Here's Jimmy Thomas. Um, 
just says J.H. Thomas, uh, who lived from 1874 to 1949, was a Welsh trade unionist and politician. He was involved in a political scandal involving budget leaks. I don't know if this is the same guy, but I'm assuming it is. Uh, A.J. Cook, Arthur James Cook, lived from 1883 to 1931 and was a British trade union leader who was General Secretary of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain from 1924 to 1931, a period that included the 1926 general strike. the text. Whilst Trotsky was eloquent in his denunciations of British Union officials and labor leaders and their moderate reformist politics, Trotsky wrote almost nothing about the underlying material and social causes of their behavior, a theme that would be addressed by post-Trotskyists. See Kelly 2018, Chapter 9, and for a critique of Trotsky's analysis, see Kelly 1988. New section, which is important for me. Stalinism and the worker state. One of the key reference points for almost all of Trotsky's writings and actions after 1917 was the Soviet state and economy. Trotsky always insisted that so long as the means of production were owned by the state rather than capitalist firms, then the USSR was a worker state. Yet the rise to power of a violent despotic bureaucratic caste led by Stalin with the accompanying restrictions on workers' rights and political activity led him to label it more precisely as a, quote, degenerated worker state, end quote. A theme most clearly expressed in the revolution betrayed. Drawing on Marx's distinction between base and superstructure, Trotsky claimed the USSR was characterized by the coexistence of a socialist economic base and a parasitic anti-Bolshevik bureaucratic caste in control of its state apparatus. The former rested on the simple assumption that state versus private ownership was the only decisive criterion in engaging a mode of production. The actual relations of production between workers and managers, for instance, were of no analytical consequence. See Howard and King, 1992, page 55. The latter claim rested primarily on the thesis that as the bureaucracy did not own means of production and could not therefore pass means of production onto their children, it did not constitute a social class. But this is only one criterion for establishing the existence of a social class and ignores the role of the Stalinist state in organizing both the domination and exploitation of Soviet workers. See Wright, 2015. I think I need to use this, like, just straight up rip off this book's bibliography. Um, it followed, so Trotsky believed, that the Stalinist regime had nothing in common with the genuine worker state established by the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. The entrenched character of the Stalinist bureaucracy eventually led Trotsky to the view that reform of the Soviet political system was impossible and that only a working class political revolution led by Trotskyists could overthrow the Stalinist tyranny. Trotsky's analysis of Stalinism and the rise of Stalin evolved significantly over time, although it is unclear whether he arrived at a satisfactory and convincing account. <laughs> Trotsky's difficulty in understanding Stalin was clearly visible in the much-quoted phrase from his autobiography that, quote, Stalin is the outstanding mediocrity in the party, end quote. Trotsky, 1930. The fact that this, quote, mediocrity, end quote, could rise to the ranks of the party to become general secretary and defeat a variety of opposition groups led by Bolshevik luminaries such as Trotsky, Bukharin, and Zinoviev suggests Stalin possessed political and administrative skills that Trotsky never fully understood. See Service, 2010. Trotsky's account of the Soviet bureaucracy is equally elusive as the definitive study of Twiss, 2010, has made it clear. A 
According to Twist, Trotsky initially understood the Stalin group to be a relatively weak political force, hovering between the working class represented by the left opposition and the petite petit bourgeoisie represented by Bukharin and the right wing of the Bolsheviks. He soon, Trotsky soon sifted to the view that the bureaucracy was the product of alien class forces, that, but after the first five-year plan and collective, the collectivization program, initially and wrongly dismissed as a, quote, left zigzag, end quote, see Swain 2006, it's probably Jeffrey Swain, I'm going to guess, uh, Trotsky concluded that the bureaucracy had become an independent and contradictory social force committed to defending socialist public property while simultaneously propose, excuse me, pursuing its own specific caste, not class, interest. Underpinning all of this different, all of his different formulations, however, was a crude pejorative view of, quote, bureaucracy, end quote, as an inefficient, self-serving, parasitic body. There is no trace of the Weberian idea of bureaucracy as a modern and efficient development in organizational structure and functioning. See Peter Bailhart's 1987, page 64. In the international sphere, Trotsky often argued that the Stalinist bureaucracy was a purely counter-revolutionary force, protecting the USSR by betraying revolutions in other countries such as China and Spain. But when the Soviet Union invaded both Poland and Finland in late 1939, Trotsky appeared to abandon the logic of his own argument claiming these were progressive revolutionary actions because the Red Army was expropriating big landlords and because the Finnish Communist Party was calling for a workers' and peasants' uprising. See Anderson, 1983a, pages 56 to 57, and Howard and King, 1992, page 57. Leading figures in the American Socialist Workers' Party, such as Max Shackman and James Burnham, queried whether a policy of unconditional defense of the USSR at attack against attack necessarily entailed the support of offensive Soviet actions, but the dispute soon spread into differing assessments of the USSR itself. Was the Stalinist group a ruling caste in a, in a, in a degenerated worker state, or should the Stalin group be analyzed as a new ruling class in a new form of class society? And was the Soviet Union a socialist economy because a, quote, worker state, end quote, own the means of production, or was the Soviet Union in fact a different non-socialist mode of production, bureaucratic collectivism, or state capitalism? See Trotsky, 1939b, and see Van der Linden, 2009. That's um, probably in reference to uh, Western Marxism and the Soviet Union, which is a tremendous book. And uh, kind of the starting uh, point of my own research interest. Revolution and the Dictatorship of the Proletariat Trotsky adhered to the Bolshevik argument that the main task of the party was to launch a revolutionary seizure of power and establish the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. But by this he meant following Lenin's The State and Revolution, published in 1917, a state apparatus organized through Soviets or workers' councils rather than a parliamentary assembly. These working class bodies would be elected in workplaces or neighborhoods and their delegates subject to regular recall by their constituents. The, quote, dictatorship, end quote, of the proletariat would be a repressive organization directed against counter-revolutionary forces and parties. For Trotsky and his followers, there's a clear and fundamental divide between the revolutionary phase of Bolshevism from 1917 to 1923, under the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky, and the degeneration of the revolution from 1923 under Stalin. It is easy enough to refute the proposition that the early Bolshevik regime inevitably led to Stalinism, the Gulags, and the Great Terror. The, 1970, excuse me, the 1927 joint opposition was a powerful force that included many leading veteran Bolsheviks such as Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev, and had recognized Stalin rather than Bukharin as the main enemy, an anti-Stalinist alliance might have produced a different outcome, a proposition argued many years ago by Bukharin's biographer, uh, Cohen, 1975, I believe it's Stephen F. Cohen, I have a piece by uh, Stephen F. Cohen uh, coming up onto the channel. Um, 
boot type size. Uh, see also Crasso 1967. Nonetheless, the fact Nonetheless, the fact there were several possible political trajectories after Lenin's death does not prove the complete absence of any common features between and pre- and post-Lenin Bolshevism. The most striking commonalities are the restriction of political pluralism. The authoritarian one-party state and the willingness <coughs> to use violence against political opponents. And it is clear that Trotsky wholeheartedly subscribed to all of them. The restriction of political pluralism proceeded through a variety of specific decisions. The rapid transfer of power in October 1917 from multi-party Soviet Central Executive Committee to the Bolshevik-dominated Council of People's Commissars, with Trotsky as Commissar of Foreign Affairs. See Fitzpatrick, 2008, page 65 to 66. The outlawing of the Constituent Democratic Party cadets and the first arrests of Mensheviks and left social revolutionary leaders in November 1917. See Orlando Figgis, 1996, and Rubinstein, 2011. The creation of the Cheka, Extraordinary Commission for the Struggle Against Counter-Revolution, Sabotage, and Speculation, forerunner of the State Political Administration, GPU, and the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs, NKVD, in December 1917, with its wide-ranging powers of arrest, interrogation, prosecution, conviction, and execution, see Fitzpatrick, 2008, and the dispersal of the Constituent Assembly in January 1918, a body dominated by the social revolutionaries, not the Bolsheviks, see Thatcher, 2003. When Karl Kautsky, 1964, well, that's, I think Kautsky died in the uh, 1938. Let's see if I'm right about that. So I can prove how smart I am. Yep, 1938. When Karl Kautsky criticized these measures, Lenin did not hesitate to denounce Kautsky as a, quote, renegade, end quote, and two years later, Trotsky was a equally scathing in his book, Terrorism and Communism, a vitriolic and authoritarian polemic directed against Karl Kautsky's book of the same title. See Trotsky, 1920. As for political violence, one of the most significant challenges to Bolshevik rule was the Kronstadt Rebellion, about which Trotsky, in 1930, said nothing, almost nothing in his autobiography, only responding when pressed by critics in the late 1930s. Trotsky was scathing about what he dismissively referred to as the, quote, hue and cry, end quote, surrounding the Krons, surrounding Kronstadt, and merely reiterated the party line from 1921, that the Kronstadt sailors were no longer the vanguard of the October Revolution's working class, but a self-interested, de-class, anti-communist social force objectively assisting the counter-revolution. See Mutnik, 1979. Um, on this channel, I have the uh, um, the principles of the Petropavlovsk Petropavlovsk uh, resolution, which was the resolution uh, adopted by the Kronstadt sailors in nineteen twenty one, um, and you should read that. You should also read. Uh, I have Ida Metz' uh, entire uh, pamphlet on the Paris Commune on here, and I have various pieces by. Um, Oh, shit. Um, why can't I think of his name? Marty Sprinton on the subject. Uh, I have also Marty Sprinton's um, book, Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, which kind of goes through the whole history of um, the decimation of workers' democracy in the early uh, Soviet state. But also I have... Um, oh, this is on here. I don't know, but um, a very good commentary on the Kronstadt Revolt is on here by a, a, a Russian labor historian named Alexei Gusev. 
He argues that it was an attempted uh, third revolution to realize the promise of all power to the Soviets, as was the uh, turn of phrase in 1917. Back to the text. Um, enough of my yak. In fact, a subsequent, as subsequent research has shown, many Kronstadt sailors in 1921 were long-serving, not recent peasant recruits, and their 15-point program for free elections to multi-party Soviets was supported by Menshevik, Socialist, revo Social Revolutionary, and Bolshevik members alike at the Kronstadt base. New section. The Imperialist Epoch. Trotsky shared the view of Lenin and most other leading Bolsheviks that since the early 20th century, world capitalism had entered a new era, characterized by the growth of capitalist monopolies, a fusion of industrial and financial capital, and the rise of inter-imperialist competition. Speaking in 1921 to the Third Comintern Congress, his main report began with these words, quote, With the imperialist war, we entered the epoch of revolution, end quote. Trotsky also presented the 21 conditions of admission to the Communist International, which included a concommitment, a commitment to support anti-imperialist struggle. See Hessel, 1980, page 41. Excuse me, page 94. Jesus Christ, what the hell am I saying? How many things have I said wrong that I just missed? I'm going to read two uh, little Wikipedia uh, introductions. Um, the Third Co World Congress of the Communist International. Uh, the Third World Congress of the Communist International, common term, was held in Moscow on the 22nd of June, to the 12th of July, 1921, the third official meeting of the Communist International included delegations from more than 50 different national structures and took place in the backdrop of two major events, the failure of the German Revolution and the introduction of new economic policy in Soviet Russia. The main languages of the Congress was, the main language of the Congress was German, the three further working language, French, English, and Russian, of the three, French being predominant. Um, the 21 conditions, uh, the 21 conditions, officially the conditions of admission to the Communist International, refer to the conditions, most of which were suggested by Vladimir Lenin, the adhesion of the Socialist Parties to the Third International, created in 1919. The conditions were formally adopted by the Second Congress of the Common Turn in 1920. Back to the text. That said, it is unclear whether Trotsky's somewhat catastroph catastrophist assessment remained fairly constant throughout the post-1917 period, as Hodgen, writing in 1975, maintains. It is clear in hindsight that in the 30 years after World War II, the global capitalist system enjoyed the most sustained period of economic growth in its entire history. Described by some as the golden age of capitalism. See Marglin and Shore, 1990. Continued adherence to Trotsky's apocalyptic vision of the 19th, of 1930s capitalism would create problems in the analysis of post-war economies, whilst a critical engagement with the evidence of the post-war boom would require the abandonment of some of Trotsky's perspective. I believe in the American Workers' Party, for instance, in the 19... 50s there there was like a split between those in who like um rejected catastrophism that um certain people uh within the um or like the majority opinion within the socialist workers party usa at that time was that like you know the that there was a uh, you know the any type of boom that was currently existing would be extremely short-lived, while others in the party who, like, kind of, like, were, you know, taking a critical stance on this issue, uh, 
viewed that uh, post-war uh, prosperity uh, would be an ongoing uh, development, not a temporary pause. And, and, you know, this is kind of like the constant thing of, like, you know, the left. Like, since capitalism's existence is always, like, at its, you know, it's on its deathbed. Not to say that, like, capitalism doesn't have severe problems or that it doesn't have, like, tremendous social consequences. But there's kind of, like, this idea of, like, perennial impending collapse that is somehow um, going to be progressive in content in terms of, like, the political consequences of it. <sighs> anyway, back to the text. Finally, it is worth commenting briefly on Trotsky's own personality because of the heroic stature he, was, he has acquired within the Trotskyist movement, particularly when contrasted with his murderous and tyrannical rival, Stalin. Trotsky's positive attributes are well known and widely recognized. He was without doubt an extremely gifted orator, a cultured and cosmopolitan intellectual, and a stylish writer of powerful and compelling prose. His book, The History of the Russian Revolution, for all its theoretical problems and limitations, is a majestic piece of literature. Trotsky was repeatedly re-elected to the Bolshevik Central Committee, at least until his expulsion at the hands of Stalin and during the early years of the revolution, was entrusted with some of the most important offices of state, including foreign affairs and war. But there is another side to Trotsky's character which goes some way to explaining his problems in building consistency, excuse me, a constituency both inside and outside the Bolshevik party in the 1920s. According to the important independent leftist Victor Serge, who worked in the Soviet Union from 1919 until his arrest in 1933, quote, we had much admiration for Trotsky, but no real love, end quote. Um, yeah, Serge was part of the left opposition uh, for a long time, but um, had uh, came into very serious disputes with Trotsky. I'm curious, see, that's why it's, it's actually reading these things is actually really good for myself, uh, because... Um, uh, Susie, what's it, Weissman, I think her name is, you know, who's like, wrote the big recent biography of Serge, um, has a paper in the ideas of Leon Trotsky about like the disputes between Trotsky and Serge, but I don't remember the finer points of them. Um, back to the text. According to Swain, Trotsky was, quote, not used to working in a team, end quote, because in the years before 1917, Trotsky had become used to editing his own newspaper, working as a freelance journalist and running his own small organization. Relations with Bolshevik colleagues were not helped by his disdainful attitude to the endless round of party committee meetings, for according to Deutscher, quote, He used to appear dutifully at the sessions of the Central Committee, take his seat, open a book, most often a French novel, and become so engrossed as to take no notice of the deliberations, end quote. Jesus Christ. <laughs> The idea that such matters were beneath him hints at a conceit that is even captured in his autobiography. Writing of the social life of his party colleagues, visits to each other's homes, drinking sessions, and trips to the ballet, he wrote, quote, If I took no part in the amusements that were becoming more and more common in the lives of the new governing, governing stratum, it was not for moral reasons, but because I hated to inflict such boredom on myself, end quote. Trotsky. Trotsky's response to criticism on issues such as Kronstadt or the creation of the Cheka, for example, was often arrogant and dismissive. When Victor Serge raised these matters in the late 1930s, Trotsky imperiously dismissed his remarks as, quote, an exhibition of petty bourgeois demoralization, end quote. Cited in Serge, 1967-39. I mean, uh, Serge died, I believe, in the early 1950s, so that would have been after his death. I believe Victor Serge died in, like, let's take a guess. 1951. Mm. Part of me is now feeling like late 40s. I'm going to say 1951. Let's see. Wow, uh, 1947. Mm. 
I was off. But I tried. Conclusions. If Trotsky was a brilliant writer and inspiring orator beyond question, Trotsky was a fierce opponent of the Stalinist leadership and his draconian policies, including the Great Terror, and his oppositional stance ultimately cost him his life. Yet Trotsky was also a keen proponent of a Bolshevik authoritarianism, fully behind the harassment and repression of rival parties, the ban on factions, and the suppression of strikes and other forms of worker and peasant unrest. It is therefore ironic that a leading member of the newly emerging one-party state should appear to many contemporaries then and now as a heroic revolutionary critic of Stalinist bureaucracy and authoritarianism. At the very least, it should be clear that his political legacy is complex and contradictory and that the relationship between Leninism, Trotskyism, and Stalinism cannot be reduced to a crude contraposition of a heroic Bolshevism and a Stalinist tyranny that have nothing in common. Trotsky's theoretical legacy, the various ideas that can be said to constitute Trotskyist doctrine, can be summarized as follows. The theory of permanent revolution, the united front tactic, transitional demands, critical analysis of the Soviet state, the necessity for a new fourth international, the necessity to build revolutionary democratic centralist vanguard parties, the necessity to build militant organizations to challenge trade union bureaucracy, the insistence on revolution, not reform, and the characterization of the imperialist epoch. Some of these themes are unique to Trotskyism, while others are shared with the official communist tradition from which Trotskyism emerged in the 1920s. All these themes are contentious and problematic. What is the status of the theory of permanent revolution in light of the numerous revolutions led by non-working class forces that have overthrown autocracies? What is the value of a united front between revolutionary and social democratic forces when the former are tiny and divided and the later have succumbed to various forms of neoliberal ideology and policy? Can working class politics really be reduced to a, quote, crisis of leadership, end quote? How are we to understand the, quote, crisis of working class leadership, end quote, in a world where political party systems are immeasurably more complex than the 1920s and 1930s, and where trade union membership levels have plummeted? Before looking at these questions in more detail, the next chapter provides brief descriptive accounts of the evolution of the Trotskyist movement in its four main world centers. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. And now um, I'm going to read these. There's three notes here, and uh, none of them are particularly uh, long, so you can stick around if you want. Um, I don't know what these are in reference to. I'm not going to go back to each one. It says uh, The first says, this is a much reduced, edited, and updated version of the chapter Trotsky and the origins of Trotskyism that originally appeared in John Kelly, 2018, Contemporary Trotskyism, Party, Sex, and Social Movements in Britain. The next chapter, I mean, the next note and note says, see, for example, the following documents from the 15 Fourth Internationals that faithfully itemize all or almost all of the core doctrinal elements. Collectif Revolution Permanente, uh, Comité d'Organisation pour la Reconstruction, Reconstitution de la um, Fourth International, 2017, Committee for a Workers' International, 2021, Fourth International Executive Bureau, 2020, Fraction Trotskista Quarta International, 2013, The International Bolshevik Tendency, 1992, International Committee of the Fourth International, 2020, International Marxist Tendency, 2021, International Socialist Alternative, 2021, League of the Fifth, Fifth International, 2020, Liga Internacional de los Trabajadores, Cuarta Internacional, Liga Internacional Socialista, 2020, Revolutionary Communist International, Revolutionary Communist International Tendency, 2021, Unidad Internacional de Trabajadoras y Trabajadores, Cuarta Internacional, 2021, and Union Communiste Internationaliste, 1988. For a thorough and critical appraisal of Trotsky's thoughts, see Kolokovsky, 1978. 3. 
It is important to note that tendencies toward factionalism and organizational splits are not unique to Trotskyism, but have also bedeviled other political movements built around well-articulated doctrine, most notably Maoism. Alexander 2001, for example, identified at least eight Maoist groups in Britain in the 1980s, as well as five each in France and Germany, while Barbaris et al. in 2000 still reported six Maoist groups in Britain in the late 1990s. The end. Thanks for listening.